try out the words, but they feel like pebbles in my mouth. And it looks as though Mel is trying not to smile. What? You said my name is Strong Earth Man. Well, I love that. How do you say my name is Strong Earth Woman? The smile that was forming vanishes. There are these times when I feel I've stepped over some sacred, invisible boundary. It's in the density of his quiet, as if all the light has been sucked into a vacuum. What did they say? I lean my head into the window and see through the outside mirror that we've done a fine job. Not even a ripple in the gravel remains to mark the spot where the dog is buried. In the beginning, I try to insist we find the owners, but if the animals aren't close to a house, the mandate is simply to bury them. No time to go calling door to door. Mal, what should I say? Easing his foot from the brake, Mel turns the truck back onto the road. Just your name. Can't I have a cool name too? We're on the road heading south, on the lookout for roadkill, bent signs, and potholes. Sun comes hot and thick through the heavy leaves of maple, oak, and poplar. When Mel doesn't answer, I turn to look full at him. Mel, how do I get a name like that? His eyelids lift, and it seems to take some effort for him to focus. He blinks. The fingers dangling from the top of the steering wheel tap at air. I've screwed things up. The long silence makes that clear. I want to apologize, but I'm not exactly sure for what. Okay, so no special name. Oh, okay. So how do I say it with the name I've got? The hard line of Mel's jaw softens. You say your name, then Ndishtikas. The sharp sound of my name, Brett, is jarring when followed by the warmth of the Ojibwe syllables. I want a name that's tough and wild, like Cougar Woman. But given that the man I live with is much younger than I am, it might not be the best choice. <laughs> and given that my request has been met with Mel's inscrutable silence, I decide not to push it. After a second attempt at Brett Dishtikaz, I say, what do you say next? From under his eyelids, Mel watches ahead through the sun-stained windshield. I say, Ramadunjaba Wawaskeshi Dudam. This invocation flows like a song, warms me right into my belly, where it's been cold for some time. Does that mean I'm from Rama? Mel nods. And the rest? My clan. You have a clan? What kind of clan? Deer. On the far side of the road, guard posts list toward the ditch. Their guide wires stretch tight. There it is, I say, pointing. I don't have a clan, I say, as Mel swings the truck around in a smooth U. So what would come next for me? Just where you're from, then Dunjaba. Where I'm from? Where your heart is, Mel says. But they're not the same place, I say. Why don't you move your chairs up a little closer here? A little here? closer. We can have a uh, little chit-chat. As far as my back and as far as my front. <laughs> that was really lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. So what have you been doing for the last 60 years? Coming <laughs> <laughs> <Don't tell> old. <laughs> yeah. The thing that uh, struck me most on reading the book uh, was the clarity of her prose. Uh, it is so clean, and uh, the the terminology she uses propels the story forward with everything. There's very few modifiers that she uses. There's no languid trips into description, particularly. Everything propels this character forward. And I, th I, I personally really relate to that kind of writing. I think of it, because I'm of a certain age, I, like Hemingway would be the first person I knew that wrote that way. Now there are lots of people who have emulated that since then. And I'm not sure, uh, are you emulating anyone? Can you, do you have uh, writing heroes that write in that style? They write in that style. Well, one of the books that really did catch me was Alyssa York's uh, Fauna, and um, she was very sweet to have written a blurb for me. Um, and I mean, I love, I like to write poetry, and so poets have inspired me, definitely. And uh, it's funny, because one of my favorite writers of all time is Leonard Cohen. Beautiful Losers. This is not Beautiful Losers, evidently. But uh, no, there's so many novelists that I love. Barbara Kingsolver, um, uh, Louise Erdrich. There's so many. Uh, I think I think a little bit of everybody kind of goes into yeah. what I write. You know, you pick. You love, ooh, I like that, the way that phrase turns. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so oh, there's lovely. no one I don't try to write like anybody, I don't think. I think I try to write like everybody I love, yeah. if you will. But you found your own voice, and that's the important thing. Yeah, certainly. Um, the, I've been a little bit, we're Facebook friends, so I remember a few years ago her journey to publish this, and uh, she was constantly, like, never gave up. She just kept applying it and sending it to people, and, you know, getting rejected and getting rejected and how difficult, I mean, I, that right stuff too, I know how hard that is on you when that happens. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your journey to accomplish this? Sure, um, I finished the book in 2016 um, on Pelee Island actually, um, and immediately sent it out to 50 agents. I, was, I had subscribed to this one place that would do that for you, tell you which, how to, how to um, query agents and each particular one. And right away I got, a, I got a, an acceptance, I asked for the full manuscript, I was an agent in New York, um, so I was very excited, like instantly, within a day she said she wanted it. Um, so off I sent it and she liked it, wanted to represent me, and unfortunately after a year she couldn't sell it. And I don't know if it's because she was in New York that she didn't quite know how to sell it. I'm not sure, but anyway, um, so I sent her my next novel and she hated that, so we parted ways. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, this one's better, you're gonna like this one, and she didn't like that one, so. Yeah, so then I was back on the road. Um, I queried every Canadian agent of every major um, agency and some of them, as in, uh, for instance, Hillary McMahon of the Transatlantic, she was marvel. no, Westwood, sorry, uh, she, really sweet, um, just couldn't, she even took a rewrite, and she said, I, I can't, I just have to be super excited about it. Um, but no, 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 down the line. Um, I got, then there was a moment that I got uh, requested a full from one of the major agencies and I sent them a full manuscript and waited and waited and waited. And that was right at the turning point. I think it was 2017, 2018, uh, when there was this, uh, the, the big five took over, just subsumed all of the sort of other major ones. And my book fell through the cracks and I didn't hear back. And then finally I said, you know, what's happening? And they said, oh, well, whatever, <laughs> sorry, too bad, too bad, so sad. Um, and then finally, so as I said, I finished it in 2016 and somewhere around 2021, uh, a writing friend, Barbara Krasner said, why don't you try Regal House Publishing? This other author that we know got published by them and they're a women's, they're a feminist, um, not feminist, but two women that run it. Um, so I did and uh, they asked for a full and it's funny because you and, and Bob uh, were there right as I was tipped over waiting to hear um, <laughs> if they would if they would take the book and and they did and that was October of 2021 and it was released in uh, March of the magic year. moment. Yeah, it was a magic moment. There's, a, there's an Instagram <laughs> post of me actually reading the, the email. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to open it. I'm going to open it. So, yeah. This is, um, even though the prose is very clear and it's very clear when you read it, it's a very complicated story. And um, it's interesting, it was interesting for me because I've spent most of my adult life trying to figure women out. And uh, she basically goes through the steps of that, you know, as because her young lover is trying to figure her out. And, and poor a Cole. Character. Sorry? <laughs> poor Cole. Poor Cole. Poor Cole gets the short end on that one. <laughs> um, and uh, so she made me uh, look at it a different way because there's so much going on um, uh, when you when you reach out to someone else and try and start a relationship. Um, so I learned something from reading this book myself. It's very complicated. There are underlying memories. Uh, some of it are traumatic memories. A few of them are traumatic memories. There's some uh, very serious stuff going on in the background. So she presents herself, or the character presents herself, uh, as 
I, I almost said dead there, but like she wants to be living. She wants to do what the living do. And so it's a story of her, and I gather, the story of her emergence into that ability to interact. Um, everybody's wondering, is this autobiographical or is this, <laughs> uh, have you gone, you've obviously experienced some of that. Some of it, yeah. yeah. I mean, because we do, we draw on what we know, um, but it's, I put I put it into different situations. Yeah, I lived in the Kootenays. Um, I've never scraped roadkill. <laughs> you know, I've never had a lover that was 10 years younger than me. Um, but there are a lot of elements. As, as you're writing, you kind of pick these pieces of, of your life out. And certainly her situation, you find out, I, this isn't giving too much away, find out quite early in the book that she is diagnosed with cervical cancer. Yeah. And that is something that I experienced. And uh, some of her pushback against how that is perceived as somehow her fault. Um, I grappled with that a lot. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, uh, definitely. So it is not autobiographical, but definitely I have used things that I know. And, and the indigenous aspect of it, which I think we were talking about earlier, is uh, everything, almost everything that comes out of Mel's mouth, because you, you meet him a lot during the story. Uh, she, she has a lot of respect for him, and maybe more than he might even want uh, that Everything that he says, I actually heard. I was married for 10 years to an Ojibwe man. I have a son who is very much embedded in the culture. So I wanted to, one of the things that was um, my issue when I met my husband was I had this very romanticized idea of what indigenous life was like. And it, it wasn't at all like that, <laughs> not at all like that. Uh, so she has this projection about what what it is to be indigenous, this sort of embedded wisdom, and he's just an ordinary guy. So that is definitely something that I've experienced. Different culture, different language, but he's just an ordinary man. He's yeah. an ordinary man, and yeah, he has some. He's got some great stories, which I hope to read a little bit uh, later. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, is a story that, when I read it, um, it's. Uh, just so you know, it's actually a real story from my son's lineage, mm -hmm. the, yeah, about the skunks. So, yeah. I want to ask you about some of the characters that we meet. Um, Nora, your friend, who has different views than the Brit character, um, and they go, they work through a series of uh, reactions to a series of events. I don't want to give too much of the story away here, but um, and they have arguments and virtually break up sort of thing and then there's a sudden kiss that appears out of nowhere that uh, maybe had a little too much booze involved yeah, with it. definitely too much booze yeah. involved in that one. This is actually a very sexy story by the way I should uh, uh, mention that um, and uh, she doesn't back off from that at all that's that's very brave of you too. That's her comfort mm -hmm. um, from and also fairly early on in the story you find out why that is why yeah. it's it's a comfort to her it's uh it's it's she turns to sex to soothe it's, you know she yeah. <laughs> yeah that's definitely and so when it, and the kiss happens right after she finds out she has cancer yes. and then she gets drunk with her friend and mm -hmm. running after skunks and yeah so again she's reaching out to find a way to make contact and to uh, to incorporate all that yeah, at yeah. the same time as she's pushing everybody away. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> People get very frustrated with her. This is the part that I found really interesting because I've experienced that with people myself, and I probably have done that myself even. You know, but you're, put, you're drawing someone in, but you're pushing them away at the same time, trying to keep yourself, you know, trying to keep yourself free. Uh, there's this line in the song, I, I, don't want, I don't want no one to squeeze me and take away my life just someone, want someone to hold me and rock me through the night, you know, and, uh, so it's give and take, eh? It's interesting. That song. There's a ghost figure sort of in this, Goldie. Oh yeah, Goldie. And it's very, very powerful presence that is a memory and a instigator of many of the uh, plot lines and the feelings, I think, you know. Uh, again, I don't want to give away too much here, but could you talk just a minute about Goldie because she's such an influence, such a 
Well, well it's, it's, it's the first trauma, the, the loss of her baby sister in the fire, and, uh, and she feels tremendously guilty for that, mm -hmm. which is the bag of stones that she's dragging through her life. Because when the fire started, she had kicked her baby sister out of her bed because the little she was eleven and her sister was three, and she always wanted to crawl into bed with her. And she kicked her out of bed, and Goldie went into the closet, so that when the fire started and the father saved her, Brett, and then went back in for Goldie, and she was dead. So this is this is her this is her first trauma that, yeah. and, and guilt that is driving everything. Yeah. Uh, through her life that, that she doesn't deserve yeah. love because she's a horrible person and she deserves her cancer and she deserves all of this and so yeah. why would anyone want to love her so the way out of that seems to be that the character finally finds someone to protect uh they find uh amara the uh the young girl right and that seems to be her way through that particular trauma like she's lost a sister now she's found someone to protect, and that brings her towards life. That lets her open up. That gives her a way out of this tragedy, you know, which I found that very interesting as well. Do you want to talk about that? Well, well yeah, I think for me it's the animals, because for her it's so much easier to be kind and loving and generous and, you know, mm -hmm. with the dog that she hits yeah. and, you know, yeah. is so protective of. Um, and Amara comes quite late, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm surprised you brought her up because she comes quite late in the story. Well, I thought it was a key. I thought it was a key to her. Well, it is for her to, for her recognizing what she was up to and what what had happened to her because there was some pretty early on um, grooming and um, what she had construed as love with her mm -hmm. older cousin, and when she meets Amara, the the penny drops and mm -hmm. she sees what's going on then she realizes, oh, maybe maybe that's not such a good thing to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because first, well, I don't, I don't want to say any more about that because there's a lot, a lot to Yeah, you gotta get her. to that, <laughs> you gotta get to that. Fair enough, yeah. Um, there was a few lines that particularly spoke to me and I, uh, I ran these by you before we came in here to see what you thought. So I'm just gonna read these out. <clears throat> a new tree has soundlessly fallen small animals scurry out of the forest so to me something has happened now and has moved and disturbed her life force to that point a tree has fallen animals are moving and to my mind this is the beginning of her rebirth of her acceptance right do you agree with that Ruth? Yeah, it, it's so funny because when you read that line to me, I didn't remember writing it. <laughs> because as I said, I finished this book a while ago. But definitely, and, and I think, isn't that the part where the, what's on one side of the, the fallen tree and what's on, yeah. so on yeah. one side is the past essentially, yeah. and on this side, everything's alive right? mm -hmm. and, and promising. Um, and that dividing line in her life is like, okay, that that's my history, but now we're mm -hmm. gonna move forward yeah. and slowly she starts yeah. to open up. I just thought it was a beautiful image and uh, I, you know, it would take me a long time to reach that point where I could say it that concisely. Here's another one. At one point, Brett says, if I were only one of those real women, and by that, what I got out of that was she doesn't see herself as real. She's seeing herself as an object more. And so she's saying, oh, it's kind of a casual line, but if only I was a real woman, well, she is a real woman, of course, you know. Uh, so is that, was that a moment of breakthrough too? Well, that, I think that she's very bitter in that moment. If I was a real woman, then I would yeah. be different, but you know, I'm a roadkill collector and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and, and don't really, like she's very, she really wants to be in control, even though she's absolutely not in control. Yeah. So, um, but she doesn't. She doesn't see herself as particularly feminine, or um, you know, soft or receptive. And like, do you remember the line where um, she goes to a yoga class and Nora tells her, uh, she, she says, "Oh, I, I'm." I'm but she says, I'm not strong. She says, "Oh, you're strong. You're just not flexible." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a very subtle book and it's uh, very complicated. The other line that I really noticed was at one point she says, well, right near the end actually, time to unwrap the present. And I thought that was a wonderful line because
because that's you can exactly find out what where she, she was. actually was. Yeah. 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 Where, yeah. So these are just moments that have uh, affected me uh, over the thing. Um, I think we'll get Susan to read a bit more, a couple of excerpts, and then we'll open it up. If anyone has any questions or anything like that, we can uh, we can get that. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I don't need the podium. I can, okay. I can, I can, I can project. Sure. <laughs> So, I mean, I think I love my scenes with Cole, with her boyfriend, but I think my favorite scenes are with Mel, her, her work partner. On Wednesday, Mel and I scour the roads for bent signs, batteries, television sets, dumped in ditches, and dead things. A splayed skunk, its black and white fur like a negative of Beckett, that's the dog, Beckett's white and black fur has stopped us on 27. I crank open the truck door and slide out onto the graveled shoulder. Doesn't stink, I say, picking up a shovel. Hit in the head, didn't die afraid. I stomp the edge of the shovel into the tangle of grasses and stand on it to drive it in. Just surprised. I smell the honey warmth of sweet grass. There's nothing like its perfume in the depths of summer. They grow in single blades, not in bunches or clusters. I can never find it, but Mel always goes straight to it, turning the delicate blades to show me. See there, how it catches the light? I like to keep a small braid in the cab to help with the bad smells. Mel tips the shovel to release the black and white creature into the hole I've made. A plume of stinky rups making me jump back. That. Mel waggles a finger at the space the smell fills, its vapor visible in the fall heat. That juice. When everyone on the reserve was dying from Spanish flu, my great-great-grandmother had my great-great-grandfather trap a skunk. She made a tea with that juice and gave everyone in the family that tea. My stomach does a half turn. Let me guess, they all died. Nah, Mel says, making that familiar wave-like motion as if coaxing the smell to penetrate. Not one of them got sick. Mel knocks back the brim of his hat and takes in an extra deep draft of the heady air. Just breathing it in can help heal you. I've often wondered why, whenever we find a skunk, Mel takes deep breaths. I thought he was just crazy for the smell. Back in the cab, Mel pops shut the door and bounces the keys in his palm. Was your great-great-grandma some kind of medicine woman, I ask? A bit of gold shows at the edge of his smile. All women are medicine women. It's my favorite line in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I like to picture his family wearing elk and doe skins, their hair in long oiled braids, praying in dark smoky circles. Even though over the years I've worked with him, I've learned these things that he shared regular head shaves with his brothers after being sent home with lice on the bug bus that his family of nine, oh, and that his family of nine ate plates of white beans standing at a card table while his father slept off the drunk from his last paycheck, and that he shared a single mattress with four of his siblings. They didn't sleep on bear skins in a cozy wigwam, but crowded around a wood stove on an icy floor in their uninsulated shack. Mel's right hand, surprisingly smooth and unblemished, is draped on the steering wheel, brown fingers in an easy gallop to the song on the radio, which happens to be the same Mariana's Trench song I heard at Nora's, all to myself. It's never enough. The singer's voice reels up and down in turns plaintive, desperate, and demanding. I wish I could breathe. Mel is quiet, not a vacant or distracted quiet, but one that seems to be listening, Maybe it's just simply quiet, no mind noise in the way, no inner chatter messing up the landscape. It might be his lineage, a tracker in his blood, but it's invariably he who spots the roadkill before I see the dark anomalies at the roadside. Skunk, coon, porcupine, dog, rabbit. He says the names of the dead things in English, but then like an echo, he names them in his mother's tongue. Zog, Esban, Gog, Nimush, Wabush, so then I'm going to just go a little further, with a little more skunk stuff. Here we go, just a short piece. Pulling down the visor, I ask as casually as I can manage, oh, because now she's found out that she has cancer. Um, how would you trap a skunk? I'm wishing I'd thought of this, that I'd known before he dropped that intact skunk into the hole. Maybe I could have harvested some. Mel's laugh is silent, but his shoulders, his, just his shoulders jump a little. Carefully, Brett, my girl, very carefully. Beckett caught one this summer. It looked like his little brother or something. Would there be more stuff left in the sack after it sprayed? You got me there. 
He shoots me a quick glance, but he doesn't ask, and I know he won't, which is why I keep grilling him. After pulling onto the shoulder, Mel and I get out and set up the jenny. Soon, hot water shoots through the first culvert, turning ice, turning ice to dirty water. Zog, he says, squatting to aim the heater's hose into the opposite pipe. They named Chicago after them. Lots of skunks in Chicago back then, I guess. When we get back in the truck, Mel turns on the radio to some news about, some, about another shooting. Funny thing, he says over the announcer's jaunty voice. The word for skunk and the word for white people sound pretty much the same. <laughs> I just want to, uh, I don't want to embarrass Susan, but she's got like really good, strong reviews for this. So I just want to just read one and go to her website or, or whatever connection she has there. I'm sure you'll see all kinds of uh, interesting stuff. But masterfully, Susan Watts entices readers with her stunning prose across a rich, complex, emotional topography. What the Living Do is a brilliantly crafted portrait of a woman grappling with her demons and the challenges she must overcome to find hope, healing, and redemption. An incredible debut, this novel is moving and unforgettable and will resonate in your soul long after the final page. So that's the kind of reviews that she's getting. Um, Can did I you read? want to read something else? I yes. just want to read, I think, I okay. think my favorite, it's a very short one. John Gould, who's a um, Giller finalist, he was the last person I asked to blurb the book and you'll see it here, but I just love this. I can't go, says Brett, the life-size protagonist of this absorbing debut novel, and I can't stay. With trenchant insight and agile prose, Susan Watts conjures a woman snagged on the horns of the most fundamental of human dilemmas. If neither life nor death will have you, what then? Stick around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I love that. That's all that would be. Yeah. That is so delightful. Did you want to read anything else? Uh, very briefly, I or? didn't have anything to do. Okay, that's fine. Um, do we have any questions? Is anyone interested? You do. I, that, why does that not surprise me? Because the last thing you said, um, the last step before you started to read it, and thank you so much, uh, was a uh, time to unwrap the present. And then yeah. did you reply so that I could see what was? So you went into past. Could you talk more just about that time? Well, just because she's so mired in her past that time to unwrap the, to actually be, because she's actually in a very loving relationship, which she keeps fucking up <laughs> and pushing him away and doing things that are really quite unconscionable and he goes away and then he comes back but you know he's really supporting her and um her present is actually good so it's it's that you know unwrapping the present obviously the using present, not in time but the present the yeah so oh. the time to unwrap the present is sort of the present it's it I was like playing with the oh, words right. yeah, it was it's both. both it's the present and the present you know yeah, so that's what that was about. Like yeah. time to really arrive here, this present that is present. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, please. Now back here first. I have two. One is, does she, does she drink the skunk tea at any point? Like, does she actually make it herself? Or no, but she gets closer to it. <laughs> Okay, that's a great question uh, because I don't have a process. <laughs> My process is really messy. I write a whole bunch of scenes and then I try to put them together in some sort of coherent. But the, the story began, I, I wanted to tell this particular story. So I just wrote it in about 10 pages, the whole thing, <laughs> 10 pages. And I gave it to one writer friend and she said, my God, this is like you're yelling because everything <laughs> happened like this, 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 and then this. So um, I realized, oh, you know what? I think I need to stretch it out a bit and have stuff happen. Um, so I didn't have, I didn't, it, it just, it happened. So there was, there was the line of the story I wanted to tell. I didn't know when I started how I was going to tell it. And then in one workshop I was doing, <laughs> One of my friends said to me, "What? She has this. She has this fascination with going to Bali to die. 
she thinks, okay, I, she, she doesn't want to have any cures because she thinks she deserves to be sick and die. So she thinks it'd be really nice to go to Bali because it's really beautiful there and they celebrate everything there. And um, so, <laughs> so uh, that came up because, I mean, little pieces come because Years ago, before she died, obviously, Anais Nin said that she wanted to go to Bali to die because uh, it was beautiful and they celebrated death. And so that, you know, that came to me. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll give her that. <laughs> you know, oh, I'll give her that. And, uh, and then, of course, the indigenous stuff was just all around me. So I put that in. And then it took months to try and figure out, okay, what season is it now? What color was it? You know, all these pieces that you have to, because I write with the Amherst Writers and Artists method of workshop facilitation. So they're prompted writings, generative writing, and you don't always remember what you wrote yesterday or last week. So you're creating these scenes, you've got your character, you've got you know, an idea, but you don't really have the, the, the smooth arc of a story. And uh, so that's, I think that's the hardest part is actually piecing it together to in some kind of cohesive arc. I wish I could say, oh, well, yeah, I do exactly. And then I've made this, you know, this schedule and this scenario, and now I knew exactly what it, because there are people who write like that, but I, I'm not uh, one of those wise people. No. We have one more question over here, I think. Sure. Yeah, thanks so much for your reading. I recently read this, so it's been pulling. Thank you. I have a, a question, and I have sent it under a little pressure, but I just, um, yeah, I wonder if, if part of your publishing journey was because of the indigenous content and the sort of change in the socio-political um, reconciliation landscape yeah. that we're in. Now. Good point. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. And um, the Second Story Press, which is a feminist press, uh, they loved it. One of the only, they said, oh, we really love your book. Uh, are you indigenous? Uh, she wrote, uh, like, well, no, but da, 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 I've been in, da, 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 da. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. No. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I think that definitely. And, and actually, um, one person that I asked to blurb my book, I didn't hear from her for a long, long time. I thought, well, okay, whatever. And then she wrote something on Facebook and she's black and um, and Canadian. And um, she wrote something that I thought, is that aimed at me? It was a little mm, edgy. So I just wrote, understood, and that was all. And then she wrote me an email and said, actually, I loved your book, but I can't because it feels like there's, um, uh, she felt that it was um, fetishizing, mm -hmm. like romanticizing to a ridiculous amount. Like I made the noble savage kind of thing. Um, and she said, uh, but uh, although I do understand that that's, that you were trying to, you know, focus on that that is not right. <laughs> but she said, um, and then she said, and I'm not surprised that you had to, uh, that Canadian uh, agents and publishers wouldn't publish it. You had to go to the U.S. because they're not as, mm -hmm. you know, tight mm -hmm. as we are. So that's a great question. And thank you for asking it because, yeah. yes. Sure. So how has it been to have your book come out in so far, pretty good. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah <laughs> better than I expected. Yeah. Bob, you had a question. Uh, uh, why roadkill? Is that a <laughs> literary device <laughs> <laughs> you came up with to talk about the world of death? Uh, the, yeah. Resurrection. I don't. Know. Yeah, death for sure, for sure. Um, you know, just by the opening thing. But what came? It wasn't. I didn't start out like that. But uh, there's um someone said once oh why are all those sign holders and on road sign are they all hot blondes all uh, right okay what if what if i have character that wasn't a hot blonde but she, whatever a re attractive woman in her 30s that wasn't just holding a sign but she was down there you know what would she be like? Oh, and then and then it all kind of came together. I thought that absolutely works, and for the reason that you actually said, that you know it's about death that she's carrying this this burden, and and you know maybe 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 the dead have the answers. So that was why. And I also really wanted to flip the script because she does that, but she's well read, she's well traveled, um, she's. No, she's not, I don't know, I don't you know, cast aspersions on people that have, you know, 
live a certain kind of life, but I wanted to make her unusual. I wanted to make her not typical. So she's traveled all over. She's been to India. She's been all over Europe. She's well read um, and you know, left high school and started to travel and work. And I think, I think her uh, first boyfriend was on road crews or something. They were doing construction yeah, or something. Thing. And so that was her, her way in. But all these just come and I go, that'll work. Ooh, that'll work. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> uh, just to follow up, I don't want to take up too much of my time, but your time. Um, oh, I'll I read... could talk about my book forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read what you wrote, but what I'd like to know is how you wrote it. Do you spend like weeks on end sequestered in some dark room? <laughs> With a bottle of gin or something. <laughs> yeah, no, the Hemingway days are done. I think <laughs> I can't. You know, he's, what did he say? You know, write drunk and edit sober. Right. Um, yeah. No, I, I, you know, I can't write drunk. <laughs> no one would understand that. Um, no, and what's so beautiful about the method that I that this book was created was almost every scene I can identify. The workshop I was in, which is this Amherst Writers and Artists method where we're given uh, a prompt, it could be a picture, it could be a thing, uh, it could be a poem, uh, to spark some part of our imagination. And, and it, they're always open. You can write a poem, you can write an essay, you can write a memoir, you can do what I did, which is, I'm going to use that. And I think the fire actually came, the idea for the fire came out of the suggestion of, you know, maybe there was a poem that had a fire in it. Um, the, the tree falling, mm -hmm. that was a poem. It was oh, a poem perfect. about the line between, mm -hmm. yeah, that was absolutely. So um, the generative pieces are written in community, in a safe space. And what's gorgeous about that method, and we have another facilitator here as well, Mary, um, is that when the feedback is, it's freshly generated work, and in those groups, where it's strength-based feedback. So people are only there to tell you what was strong for them or what stayed with them or what's working. And that keeps you writing. Yeah. Like the first workshop I went to, it had been years since I'd been seriously writing. I wrote very seriously when I was much younger. And then I kind of got into spiritual things, went off to India, then I got married and, and, and raised a kid. And then I was like, oh, I really want to be writing again. And I'd lost my confidence. Mm. I just, I was like, I don't, how do you do this thing? I still don't know. But I, um, someone suggested that I go to this workshop. And it was with Sue Reynolds. And I left that workshop. I actually was crying because I, I can do this. I can do this. So unlike you know, MFA programs or the academia, which are ready to slash it to pieces, this buoys you up and it you know, only talks about what's actually working and you're like, oh, that's working. So it keeps you writing. But then, this is a long answer, but um, so it got this buckets and buckets of, of scenes and that's when you need to go be by yourself and stitch them together and try and figure out what the hell are you trying to say here and how do we make that art happen? So, yeah. So no, and, and that's the beauty of this method is that so many of them, there are thousands of us now that are doing this method, um, is, is, is that it's, it's, it's safe and it inspires you and it keeps you writing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mary, you had a question? Yes. So as you know, I love this book so much and I want to know if you miss the characters because I miss hearing about them more and keep wondering. <laughs> I'm just wondering, as the as the author of this magnificent work, do you miss these characters? Yeah, yeah, that's the weird thing is, especially Brett is so real to me that I had, um, there's a, an apartment building in Barrie, Ontario, where that's where she, she lives there. <laughs> and uh, it had been a few years and I was driving through Barrie past that apartment building and I had this really weird feeling like I wanted to go visit her and this is a strange kind of nostalgia it's like don't even she's not a real person <laughs> you made her up yeah and that it kind of made me sad <laughs> oh dear yeah. so Anybody thank you that's, that's nobody's asked me that question before <laughs> any more questions do you think 
Yep. Um, I find, um, thanks for ex I just um, repeating up everything you're saying. It's so interesting. Um, I'm not a writer, um, unless it's a proposal <laughs> or something. But um, I find it interesting between this kind of generative, that's what works thing, and then the going off on your own. Um, but um, so what I, and you don't have to talk about this if you don't want, if you don't want power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes the things that don't work still hold something that's important to you, or even though it's messy or... So I, I felt like when you're talking about like what worked and what didn't work, I mean, let's face it, you're sitting in a, you're sitting in a group of other people who want to write. So there, there's like really intelligent minds listening to what works. But they might not recognize that what does... I, I, I'm thinking. It seems that they could not recognize what doesn't work, maybe because... Um, the content doesn't appeal to them, or maybe because it was so raggedy in its its uh, presentation, but there are still some seeds there that are just, it's not the right time, or maybe they were only like, like there are so many reasons why things don't work. And so do you ever keep those? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, because, because they're not, they don't say, this is the only thing that works. It's like, this is what stayed with me. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, that's great. So. I, you know, people might say a bunch of things about a piece that I've just written in 15 minutes, um, but I, and I'm thinking, well, this piece is working. They like this. It doesn't mean that I'm going to jettison the parts that weren't mentioned. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's not the only thing that works. It's just it just gives you enough impetus just to keep going. Like if this is working, then I, you know, I'm onto something here. And sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they say it's great, and you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they never, they say that it's bad. Like, that's not allowed in these workshops. Yeah. Like, you can't say, oh, no, that, that really didn't work for me. You don't, that doesn't happen in these workshops. It's not allowed, you know? It's only, oh, that really stuck with me. Yeah, resonates. For, for my book, I would never have written it if it hadn't been in these workshops. Yeah, Ruth came, Ruth came, came to Costa there, Rica and, and, and wrote yeah, it. was kind of like, you know, a few of the stories do the same well, I want to know what happened next. I think, okay, that's one to work on, you know? Uh, so it just gave me the courage, really, to take the next step and actually write it. So. So you could bring that concept to Parliament. <laughs> yeah, rather than, oh, exactly. Positive. Absolutely, yeah, let's stop cutting each other's feet off. And just, yeah, yeah, it's so true. There's a lot of gatekeeping in, in, the, in the institutional in the art, in the institutional arts, I mean that's all I yeah. have observed. That's the only area where I've observed. It. And so, I think the gatekeeping is, is not always is not always uh, working. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, the uh, there's a um, you know that there's so many books that are self published, and a lot of them are very good, but you don't know. So there's a, there's a there is a, the benefit of a certain kind of gatekeeping in publishing uh, agents and publishers vetting, yeah. you know, and filtering out. Uh, so it, it's really, so in that case, you need sort of quality control. And it's, it's the Wild West out there. So <laughs> um, but I don't know, in the other arts, I don't know. I, you know no, really well, well, I was referring more how you're talking about academia and how people could be slapped. And I mean, I've met in my life so many people who said, "Oh, I, you know, I have this degree and that degree, and I couldn't get a show, so I just stopped doing art." And it just like, oh, um, it's it's so much longer um, the the creative life. It is. So we don't do it for the money. No. <laughs> there are hundreds of dollars to be made in. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions, do you think? Or we're gonna head down down in a few minutes down to the cafe and we can all go down there and continue this conversation. By yeah, the way. that'd be great. And, yeah, you're all welcome to come on down with us. And uh, if that's basically it, um, thank you all for coming out. Yeah, Very good you. to see the week. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. They have some books here, they are here for sale if you feel the need to leave with one. Cheers. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming.
turn it off. Oh, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> oh, I think you're the only one. But thanks for coming. What's that? Oh, signing. Yeah, where's my pen? Okay, I've got to turn this off.